Hello and welcome to another episode of Laptop Retrospective. This is Think Design Stories. In this series, we will be going behind the scenes on one of the most iconic laptop brands ever conceived and is still going strong. Tom Hardy's career is a distinguished one. Tom spent over 22 years with IBM as an industrial designer, design center manager, and corporate IBM design program director. During that time, he worked on various projects from advanced single-user computers to development of the IBM personal computer. One of his advanced projects was an industrial design model of IBM SCAMP, considered by PC Magazine to be the world's first personal computer prototype. Tom was the corporate IBM design program director during development of the very first ThinkPad, Model 700C, and collaborated with IBM industrial design consultant Richard Sapper. After IBM, Tom founded the consultancy Verbal Visual Framework and worked with several key brands such as Coca-Cola, Ford, Lenovo, Lowe's Maytag, Microsoft, Polaroid, Porsche, Procter & Gamble, Samsung, Tupperware, Verizon, and Xerox. Tom's work has been cited in numerous books and publications, including Times Magazine's Top 50 Most Influential Gadgets of All Time, and has won international awards for product design over the years. Currently, Tom is a professor and graduate coordinator of design management at the Savannah College of Art and Design. The early days of the personal computer were an incredible time for technological developments. Tom Hardy's career with IBM was at a key moment where they were beginning to move into the single-user computer business. Tom discusses some memorable moments in the development of what we now know as the personal computer. With regards to how I started at IBM, um, I studied industrial design at Auburn University. And when I graduated, I went to work at IBM in Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on uh, large systems. You know, back in, and this was in 1970, so there was no such thing as a personal computer in the industry at that point. And so Poughkeepsie was uh, kind of the center of large systems, and I did work on looking at future systems which included knowing that the technology was gonna get smaller, for example, displays were gonna get thinner. Uh, you know, IBM had this wonderful resource in IBM Research. And uh, we would take advantage of that and get insight from, from those folks whose job it was to look at technology. They weren't product or oriented per se. That was the product division's job. So IBM Research's role was to look at technology and develop, develop uh, innovation in the context of the company's business model and where it was going to be going in, tech, in the technology industry. And so uh, we got a lot of insights from them. So we would use that to start developing some design concepts of where this might go and how, how we might be prepared for that uh, you know, in the future when it happens. And so I, uh, I worked in Poughkeepsie for a little over three years, and then I got the opportunity to uh, transfer to a completely different geographical environment, some Boca Raton, Florida, uh, or IBM had just opened a development laboratory there. <clears throat> and one of the areas they were working on was this new business group called uh, Entry Level Systems. At that point, it was small business. So as technology was moving down and getting smaller, it was not yet to the personal computer level yet of products. It was still business oriented, sort of the front end of large systems or large medium sized systems, for example, workstations, custom products. There are a lot of really interesting custom products such as uh, for maritime systems, you know, an, an engine room console for a huge super tanker, a huge super uh, freighter, uh, adapt, portable dialysis machines, uh, and other types of products where the, the, main, uh, the main IBM product was a processor unit. 
but all the applications needed specific products. Some could be main, mainstream products that IBM had, but in a lot of cases, uh, large customers would want to customize things. So that was really exciting because we, really, we got into quite a variety of, of, of products, you know, uh, that product ideas that way. And so um, about it, I guess, shortly after I moved to uh, Boca Raton, Florida, there was an executive, his name was Bill Lowe. And I look at Bill as the uh, father of the IBM personal computer, frankly. Um, <clears throat> In, uh, in 1970, around 1973, he uh, funded a project in the Los Gatos, California research lab. Again, the, the folks out there that were working on technology. IBM Research had uh, various laboratories around the world in New York and California and Switzerland and other places in Japan. Uh, and <clears throat> He chose the one in California based on the skills that were there uh, because Mr. Lowe knew that uh, technology was going in the direction of uh, basically creating a personal computer type of business. Now, personal computer was the term wasn't even in the vernacular back then. We called it single user computers hmm. because before that, you know, everything was on the mainframe. If you if you had a terminal in front of you, a display, it was a dumb display, uh, just a monitor. It wasn't like what we have today that's got intelligence in it. You plug it into the wall and you, you can make it out of a computer in one box with a display. Back then, everything was off the mainframe system. Um, and, and it's interesting that today the cloud sort of starts to come back in a sense, to some of that. Yeah. You know? It's really interesting. But anyway, Mr. Lowe really had the insight into what, what was going to happen. And so he wanted to uh, have a project that he could take up the chain that I, and IBM corporate management and, and start to sell the idea that this is a business that's coming and we should start to think how we're going to get into that, that kind of scenario planning, if you would. Uh, <clears throat> And, and the number of years down the road. And so uh, the group in uh, IBM Research and Los Gatos created a prototype, a one of a kind. It was called SCAMP, S-C-A-M-P. The acronym, uh, it's a technology acronym and I frankly, I don't remember exactly what, what it, I could never remember what, what it was. I know SCAMP, but I never memorized the, the long acronym. At any rate, um, and it's in the Smithsonian now. Hmm. And uh, PC Magazine uh, labeled it the world's first personal computer. Now, it wasn't sold. It was not the first personal computer that was sold. It was a prototype. But what they did, they took, I think it had a five inch display in it. It had a, a, a data cartridge, like a cassette cartridge that had a data, it had a keyboard and processor, and they emulated a big mainframe uh, operating system into a smaller operating system. And it was the only box at that time that you could take and put on your desk and plug into the wall and do real computing on. It did not go to the mainframe. So that's, it was, it was powerful enough and had the right components to be labeled the world's first personal computer. So, uh, engineering created this prototype that was it was large, you know, because they were using a lot of off-the-shelf stuff to make this, and, and it, it really wasn't designed to uh, follow IBM's design language and the design program that we had. Um, it was strictly to show the technological feasibility of putting all that stuff in one box. Um, so I was asked by my, my management to do an industrial design concept at SCAM. Um, so I, I studied the technology that they had in there, and then I created uh, a model. I had a model built of one that was smaller. It had a little bit larger screen. It had a coupler. 
uh, because there was no internet back then. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't hit publicly until about 1993. Um, so there was, there was no internet for the public then, but you could send data over telephone lines. You know, if you, so you put the receiver or the phones back then on the coupler, and then it was a keyboard. Uh, and uh, I used, for the keyboard, I used a touch panel uh, technology that we had developed at IBM for uh, large and medium-sized computer control panels that might be made up of uh, gosh, you could have anywhere from 20 to 50 or so buttons and lights, maybe even more, depending on the size of the, of the product. So each one of those buttons and lights was a discrete product number. So wow. there's an engineer in Poughkeepsie, his name was Tom Harris, and Tom had developed the touchscreen technology, which was is similar to what we do today on our phones, except it wasn't conductive. You know, with our with our fingers, uh, it was a piece of of mylar with all the graphics of the buttons and the LED lights under it uh, indicated on the top, color coded, just like a real control panel would be. And underneath was a switch, you know, a a, a thin mechanical switch on the board. So. From a cost standpoint, it was significant because it was one, one piece of mylar printed with the, all the button materials and the graphics as opposed to, you know, 100 or so part numbers for controls. Um, but for keyboards back then, <clears throat> excuse me, with the, well, the mechanical keyboard was still the mode of operation in the 70s. We, we got into uh, electronic keyboard later in the 1970s, early, early, eight, early 80s. But uh, back then it was mechanical. And so for high entry data, you needed a mechanical throw for the technology and they had to be nine, you know, a certain um, number of millimeters apart. A lot of human factors were, went into that. And so, um, but I used, I used the flat panel on this keyboard for this concept of a future personal computer, one, to make it look future, because that flat panel technology was not used everywhere around the world. You know, IBM used it on select products and a lot of other companies didn't use anything like that. So it made it look future and it was simple. Uh, and so uh, Mr. Lowe took that model and uh, together with the engineering prototype, uh, up the chain through IBM uh, senior management to uh, try to gain some interest in, in the personal computer business or the single computer business that we called it back then that was coming down the road. So of course he got, he got interest in it, but you know, there was no market had developed yet for those types of products and IBM's business model was you know, the market needs to develop to a point mm -hmm. because of the company that large. I mean, at one point when I was there, we had 450,000 people, I think in about 160 countries. So a huge organization. So obviously it takes some funding to support a machine like that, right? And so they had certain constraints in terms of when, what kind of products they would get into uh, and when they would do it based on what the market was. And it was a, it was a valid uh, strategy for business model. So uh, as, as time went on and technology started changing, then Mr. Lowe uh, came to me and I, I was assigned to him as sort of his personal designer, if you would. So in, in addition to the main products I was doing for IBM for the product plan uh, that, were, that were going to be manufactured, um, then I would do these, these one-off ideas and build a model and give it to him. And then he would, again, take it through the system. So I probably did about, oh gosh, I don't know, maybe six, six or eight of those over time between 1973 and 1980. Um, some of those are in a book. It was published several years ago called Delete, 
It's about the com it's a computer vaporware is the term that the author used. Uh, Paul Atkinson is, a, is an author from, from uh, the UK. And uh, we had a mutual friend in London who uh, it turns out he knew that I had worked on some of these early computer products. And, and, and Paul was putting together a book on different companies that did these products to help sell an idea, not necessarily intended to be manufactured per se, but to use for strategy and illustrate what could be. And so uh, he contacted me and asked me if I had worked on some of those things. And I said I had. And so uh, he, uh, he wanted to meet me and uh, we, we got together and uh, I showed him some of these things. And, and by that time, they weren't confidential anymore. You know? um, and uh, he really liked the content. And so he got IBM's permission to use them and to print them. So they're now, I think, about, about three of them are in this book. Very cool. And I'm probably the only one who had photographs, still had photographs of this, because this was a one-off small project in a laboratory. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a product that IBM had. It's not, it was, so it wasn't in IBM archives. Uh, it, was, it was just this uh, singular model done for a, a one executive to show, for show and tell. And, and so thank goodness I still had slides because that, was, that was a slide day, so 35 millimeter. I still had slides in a box in my attic. And IBM archives didn't even, you know, I had no idea what this stuff was. Uh, and so I was, I was delighted that we finally saw the light of day on all this work that, that we did. Um, and looking back on it, it's, it, was, it was really interesting. You know, we had to make a lot of assumptions back then. Um, and some of the photographs that we shot uh, uh, in the studio for Mr. Lowe to, car to carry or send around and addition to the model, I used my daughter who was six years old at the time as a future customer. Okay. And there were some shots we had where she had a, we put a glass of milk and some cookies, you know, next, next to this computer, which, which is plugged into a, a television set, which it could be a monitor or it could be a TV set. And then she was using the keyboard on this thing. And, and, and uh, they were color. You know, some were yellow, and that was that code name was Yellowbird. And you know, we did some that were blue and that were red. Um, and it, again, it was trying to give the indication that this was a consumer type of product. We also built a mock up of uh, what a computer store mm. could be. You know, there, in IBM's case, uh, the only product that was sold to a retail store was a typewriter and some dictation equipment that they had back then out of the office products group. Uh, and then of course, uh, ribbons, supplies that went to products, but there, there weren't any computer products per se that were sold in a store until the personal computer came along. But we knew, we knew that that was gonna be the mode uh, that these things would have to be sold at not just using IBM sales force, which was the, the model all the way up to that point. All IBM products were sold by you know, professional IBM salespeople. Um, so we made, a, we made a mock up of what the store was, could look like. And then we put a lot of products on it and photographed it with a group of people, including my daughter, as uh, customers that would come in and look at these old is a single user computer. That was that was exciting to work on those things. Um, and uh, like I said, I was really pleased that it, it, it uh, got out of the box and it was that people could actually see some of this work that's going on. And, and the book it just doesn't cover IBM stuff. It covers a lot of different companies. You know, it was, it was it's a unique book. I think it's still, you can still buy it. Um, 
I so, have to try um, and track one down. Yeah, I think you can get on Amazon or any bookstore probably still has that. Um, and so uh, that leads me, that kind of starts to lead me into uh, the personal computer introduction at, at IBM. So having worked behind the scenes on all these ideas for Mr. Lowe, uh, the last one that I did, which is also in the, in the book, was based on an Atari platform. So he, he, he's, he wanted me to go to Atari in California and look at the Atari 800, which was like a cartridge, game cartridge, little product. And uh, there was only one person that knew I was from IBM. So I, I was to be discreet about where I was from because they didn't want the, you know, the Wall Street media to think the IBM and Atari are you know, dancing together or whatever. And so I went out and I learned about the product from this fellow and, and then I brought one back with me. And, uh, and so I had to make a model using the, using the electronic platform. So I had to make a design that didn't look like Atari. Mm -hmm. It would look like an I, IBM. And that's the first time we put IBM personal computer, I press type it on the cover next to the IBM logo. And uh, I changed the, the form. Uh, the Atari was rather angular and it was more of a kind of a tan color. So I changed it to white, uh, put an IBM keyboard in it and with, some, with a few color keys um, and then put radiuses. I softened up the, the form, the overall form to make it look not only to make it look different than the Atari thing and try to just separate the, the perception of that, but um, to give it a more of a human flavor, you know, a little, a little uh, more, more emotion to it. And so I, I, I created that model and gave it to Mr. Lowe. He took it back up the chain and uh, <clears throat> he went in to IBM's, to the CEO of IBM and other senior management, and basically said, this was a way for us to get into the personal computer business quick, was to basically buy Atari. And this was an example of what we could do with it. Now, the reason that they were looking at getting, getting into it quickly was that they waited a long time because the first, I think the first product called the first that appeared that was sold was the Altair 8080, I think was the number, in 1980, 19, excuse me, 1975. Now, it didn't have a keyboard, it didn't have a display. It had toggle switches and or LED, red LED lights, and you could, pro, you could program the toggle switches so the lights did different things, you know, so somebody here said, ooh, you know, they did computer. <laughs> yeah, I know, sounds kind of stupid now, but back then, that was like, you, that was looked at as being computing in a box that you could plug in the wall, not tied into a mainframe. In fact, that is the product that pulled Bill Gates away from uh, Harvard. And he and, you know, uh, I think it was Paul Allen, went, went, was at school with him. They went out to Albuquerque and started this little company that, was working on operating systems for, for the guy, you know, and eventually I guess they put a keyboard and displays a bit later. And that was the beginning of Microsoft. So, and so after, after that came, that product came out and people started really, you know, gravitating to this. Of course, there were hobbyists back then. That, that was, that was a point in time in the computer business, but technology business, where the hobbyists were taking pieces similar, what they, similar to what the uh, IBM researchers did in Los Gatos and put together their own homebrew, if you would, uh, computer. In fact, Homebrew Computer Club was the name of the local uh, 
hobbyist group in Palo Alto, California, and that's where Steve Jobs and Wozniak met in, during that club. And so, and so uh, <clears throat> the hobbyists started creating these things, and then uh, there was a ton of startups at the start. You know? Everybody wanted to jump in the business because they could see where this was going now. Um, but IBM kept saying the market hasn't developed yet, so we're going to wait. Fundamentally, wait till the market develops, and then we'll go in and you know and, and take it. I mean that's that was a business model. Um, and so, about 1980, you know, there were there were shareholders and and the uh, financial area was asking, you know, where's IBM's personal computer? And so there, there was some pressure to make to make one quickly. So anyway, the Atari was put on the table. It's a way to do it quick. And uh, from what I heard, the CEO, in essence, I'm not quoting what he said, but in essence, he basically said, you know, are you crazy for doing something like this? So, you know, something to the effect of, you know, what would the media and our, and our stockholders say if the largest computer company in the world had to go buy a little company like Atari to, to make our own personal computer? Mm. And so Mr. Lowe pulled out plan B and said, we can do it in 12 months inside if you give us the right to streamline the development process because in IBM typically it's a multi-year process because of a lot of different reasons, test, testing, and you know, a lot of validation that they did, which was good. But for a product like this, you really didn't need that stringent a, a process that had been used for larger, more sophisticated products. And uh, they also said, we need the right to fundamentally run over people, around people, you know, around the bureaucracy in a big company like that. Uh, you know, they, they weren't going to run around things like safety and key things, but uh, they got the right to do that. So then that group was formed in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, this, there was a public manager, a director, a dynasty who was assigned to run that. And Mr. Lowe moved up to another level of executive. Uh, and then I was assigned as the industrial designer of IBM's first PC that came out in 1981 uh, because I'd been working with Mr. Lowe on all these little projects. So that was nice that they assigned me to that. <laughs> and that, that in itself was an experience. Um, a lot of war stories on that. <laughs> You know, okay. some good, good, bad, and indifferent ones. Uh, it was kind of crazy. Things were happening. So, um, and so after I, uh, after I did that product, I got offered a management job uh, in IBM Lexington, Kentucky. And um, so I worked on designing products for 10 years. That was my, 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 about my 10th year of designing products. So I sold my soul to man and moved to Lexington. And in Lexington, they were still making typewriters, the selected typewriters and a whole line of different ones because um, the personal computer, I mean, I was up there before the personal computer was announced. You know, I left, I left Boca after my design work was done and all turned over to engineering for, for manufacturing and so forth. Uh, and uh, they were making uh, keyboards, getting into electronic keyboards and a lot of supplies uh, and, other, and other products there. So um, I had to start a new design center that, um, <clears throat> that followed in the footsteps of Elliot Noyes, who was the uh, IBM corporate consultant that Tom Watson Jr., who was the CEO uh, starting in 1955, he took over from his father, Thomas Watson Sr., who was the founder of IBM. And uh, uh, Mr. Watson uh, decided that he wanted to make design part of his legacy. 
So he brought in Elia Noyes, who was an architect and an industrial designer uh, who had actually been working on, a, on the IBM typewriter with an outside consultant. Uh, he and Mr. Watson, it turned out, knew each other in the Pentagon during World War II. Uh, so, yeah, it was interesting. I, I think their offices were right next to each other in, in that, that part of their life. Uh, there's some interesting stories about that. But, but at any rate, uh, so Elliot came in and assessed the situation and brought in Paul Rand to uh, preeminent graphic designer to... Uh, helped shape the graphic identity of the company, to reshape it, and then brought in Charles Eames to work on communicating technology in the company through exhibitions and films. But back then, technology was a mystery. Uh, you know, again, there weren't any personal computers, particularly in the 1950s, you know. Uh, and technology was seen by the public as some mysterious thing uh, you know, in a locked computer room somewhere, because that's where most of those things were, you know. Uh, what did they do? Are they going to control our lives? Uh, and so what Eames' job was, was to take the technology and humanize it and show how the technology can help uh, the quality of life, you know, agriculture, medical, and so on and so forth, a lot of different case studies. Uh, so anyway, that group of consultants or what started to build the IBM uh, product and, and brand identity into a contemporary uh, looking and, and uh, working company. Um, because before that, their, their products, for example, in graphics were all over the place. And they were, they were, they were old and they, did, they actually didn't match the advanced technology that the company was developing. So it was this dichotomy that the visual image of the corporation didn't match what it was doing. And that's what Mr. Watson wanted to fix. So, so Elliot, uh, in, his, in his office, it was in New Canaan, Connecticut. He had an industrial design firm there. And uh, he, kept, he kept the typewriter in his office because that was the IBM consumer product. You know, it was a business machine, but it could also be used in the home as a personal typewriter. So he kept, he kept all those office division consumer products designed in his office. And he dealt directly with Lexington that made those products. Whereas the rest of IBM products were done by internal designers in multiple design centers around the world. Uh, at the time, I was asked to create one in Lexington. And this, by the way, this followed Elliot's death in 1977. He died early, unfortunately, um, and uh, unexpectedly. And so uh, they wanted to have a design center there with internal staff, just like they had at 14 other ones around the world, Japan, all over Europe, and all over the United States. And so my job was to uh, create a new facility and hire staff and all that, which is really quite interesting as, a, as a, my first management job. And I think that's probably one of the reasons that I moved from designing products into management was because that was an interesting challenge was to build something from the ground up. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. And so that's when I started working with uh, Richard Sample. Richard Sapper was brought in in uh, late 1980 to replace Elliot. Uh, and uh, Richard was a German designer that he uh, moved to Italy, uh, I don't know, several years after he, after he graduated, he worked for Mercedes and then decided to go to Italy. And he teamed up with uh, some Italian designers, preeminent ones, Marco Zaniso was one of them, and they designed a lot of products jointly. And then he opened up his own studio in Milan. And he had never designed a computer before. But IBM <clears throat> design management at that point in corporate really re respected his intellect. And he had this wonderful combination of being a German designer with functionality 
and a rationality, but he had the Italian flair and the surprise in his products. So it was this really nice mix that you didn't find everywhere like that. So they didn't care if, I, if he'd never designed a computer before. In fact, they, they, they thought that was an advantage. That he didn't come up that way. He was smart enough to do that. There was some problem. Uh, so he, uh, the first uh, product that he was asked to do was a product that I had in my laboratory um, of an advanced typewriter. And uh, when I got to the, when I got to that location, I uh, did an assessment of all the stuff that was in development to try to find out what had been going on. Uh, and uh, there was uh, close to a three-year lapse between the time that Elliot died and the time that Richard came in and the design center came in. Uh, so there, there are some people in his office that were following up with uh, the, uh, the engineering groups uh, in Lexington because of the products were still going on. You know, if they had designed that would happen for another probably couple of years. But um, unfortunately, it turned out that nobody was looking at the advanced stuff that the engineers were doing. Um, because the, when you when you had a design center uh, associated with a development lab at all these other locations, and most of them had manufacturing there as well, so the designers were really close on a day to day basis with all the engineers and weren't remote. So IBM has uh, had and still has a decentralized design program, but it's it's managed from a centralized location, but there's, uh, there's a lot of coordination involved in something like that. So not having a design center on a day-to-day -day basis where you could see what was going on, you could hear some talk about what was going on. Then they developed, they were developing a new ribbon technology called resistive ribbon, which was non-impact. This ribbon was charged and the, and the, and the ink would kind of fly through the air to hit the paper. It was just, amazing technology. It was like the next biggest thing in that product business area uh, after the ball, you know, the IBM's selected typewriter with the famous type ball. Uh, and you know, that, that IBM typewriter with the ball was the first time that the platen didn't move. Because on typewriters from the beginning of when those, those, those products were designed, uh, the keys were the type bars and the platen move is really typing, the, the platen move and the paper move. And, the key, you know, so, and so the ink ribbon was in the same place. With the ball, the ball moved and rotated and the platen stayed in place. And that's why the selected typewriter that Elliot designed this beautiful product was it's like a sculpted, this beautiful sculpted form, like a singular form. It didn't have to have a separate thing in the back that slid back and forth like the plat. So anyway, the Selectric was a huge step in, in electron typewriter design. Uh, and this uh, resistive ribbon offered a similar opportunity to do something design-wise that would reflect this innovation. So what we wanted to do was to use that as an example of IBM taking this technology and doing something really sort of radical because in the company, you know, you can get you can get hung up and well, not hung up is probably not the right word to use, uh, because systems are really important in, in that corporation. And so, some, but sometimes you need to break the rule or you need to do something, you know, get out of the box a little bit to show that you're doing something different and it's not just the same old, same old stuff. And so this was an opportunity to do, to do that. So I've uh, 
got approval from corporate to use Richard on the project. Which, and he came back with a concept he called the upright typewriter. It was never built. But that was my first management job working with, you know, with Richard on the advanced project like that. So uh, he, because the ribbon didn't have to be oriented to the platen like all typewriters do, you could bend it. And so he created this typewriter, which is like a parallelogram. And it, it brought the type, the, 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 the point of typing closer to the eye. It was great for ergonomics. And it looked it's this beautiful, unusual product. Uh, and so we took, we took that in to engineering. And of course, they were astounded at what the concept that he did. But they also said, we can't do it because we've been working in the back room on this technology and we've got a lot of things that are oriented like traditional typewriters. You know, the, 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 the print head being in a certain direction and the keyboard relationship and all this, more, more of a horizontal typewriter rather than turning it all up at an angle. I, they didn't say they couldn't do it. They, they basically made the argument that the typewriter business is going down which was true because PC is coming up, PC and a printer, you know, and uh, you can do you can do letters and much more with the personal computer and a printer than you can with the typewriter. So they knew that the business was going down and they calculated that for them to go back and redo what they had done to put it in this, work, this orientation would be too expensive. So corporate design escalated it it's a process in IBM where you can escalate something like going to court. You go up the next level of management. And if you win that, you go to the next one and you can ultimately get to the CEO with an issue. Uh, and so they took it up the chain and uh, the Lexington business unit made, made the argument that I just kind of talked about was uh, the expense of doing that versus the life of the typewriter. Of course, part of our argument was, okay, every, we all understand that, but this could be, a, this is a brand image piece that has value beyond just the value of getting the product out the door and how many people you sell it to. This is going to get a lot of notoriety because it's so unusual and it's really different. And it's got all these advantages. And da, da, da. And Richard Sapper did it. And, you know, Richard has more designs in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York and any other design in the world. A lot of people don't know that. And a lot of people don't know actually who Richard was. Like they know his products, the products that he did. But, but he wasn't like uh, you know, other designers that uh, go out and have a PR firm and you know, they do all this whiz bang stuff and wear capes or whatever the, whatever the trick is that they're, the image they're trying to make about being a flamboyant designer. Richard was just really low key and did, and did, did the work uh, and didn't try to promote himself at all. So, um, so at any rate, we lost that one. And uh, that takes me in terms of my career that you're asking me about, the long winded way of explaining how I got into IBM. Through my early days and then up, up to working on the personal computer concepts and then into the original PC and then, move, and then moving into uh, the management at the, at the design center. But Lexington is also the first time that I worked with Paul Rand because <clears throat> all those consumer products would be the supplies the ribbons and ink and a lot of other things, those were sold in consumer supply stores. So we wanted the packaging to be consumer product, color, really interesting on the shelf. And so of course, Paul did all of the, the corporate, the major corporate identity work. So when I got to Lexington, he was the consultant doing, already doing that work. So I moved into giving him projects, uh, which was, uh, a priceless experience. I probably worked with Paul because after Lexington, I went to the corporate office. But 
for about 13 years. And it was an um, unbelievable experience sitting across the table from that man. He was a tough critic. One of the toughest critics I ever sat in front of. Uh, but you respected him, but he, he was right. And he didn't try to play politics. He didn't need IBM as a client. He was successful. And IBM tried to get individuals like that, like Richard and Paul and so forth, because they were uh, direct and honest. And they would tell us what they thought was right or wrong. You know, they weren't looking to keep the contract going for another five years to support a big, a big design office. Richard was by himself, Paul was by himself. So I, uh, I remember one time <clears throat> coming into a meeting with Paul, his studio was at his house in Western Connecticut. And uh, he was still meeting with one of our designers uh, looking at his portfolio because we tried to send our designers up to Paul once a year and have him give a critique of the work. He really helped the thing to do. And uh, so in Paul's house, when he met with them on project, she met with him at the dining room table. He, he came in the door, it was over to the right. And he could go around and sit in the living room to wait. Then there were no walls, so you could hear what was going on around the corner. So when he, when he got through with, with this the designer's work, he asked him how old he was. And I think the designer said something like, I'm 35 or something like that. And Paul said, well, you still have time to be good. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure that destroyed the designer's ego because the designer probably, I'm going to grab it down with IBM. Right? Gee, I've made it now and all this. But if you thought about it, that was a compliment because it was hope. You know, if the guy was doing lousy work, Paul would have told him that and he said, you know, like, who hired you or something. To, I don't know if he would have said that exactly, but something to the effect of, or maybe, I don't know. I don't think it'd go so far as to say you should be driving a bus, but there would be there would have been something like that. Paul had this wonderful way of getting his points across, um, and so I'm sure that I'm sure that guy left there <laughs> with him depressed. But uh, again, that, that, that there was hope for him in, Paul, in Paul's mind. And there there was a time when when I had been a meeting with him after he had had a, a meeting with designer like that. And he, Paul was aware that uh, he was tough, you know? So after, after he was tough, I know he asked me once, he said, do you think I was too hard on that guy? But when he does it, he just, he, he focused on it. He was focusing on design excellence in the, in the bar of excellence was Paul Lamb. That was Paul Rand's bar of excellence, right? So uh, anyway, a lot of experiences with him. Um, it's, it was just like getting a PhD in graphic design. I don't claim to have a PhD in graphic design, but it was like that in terms of the depth and exposure to knowledge of that, of that man. Sometimes he would pull out things that he was working on for somebody else, maybe two alternatives and ask you which one you like the best. Now, if you, if you selected the one that he liked, that would, it made you feel really good, you know? I'm, hey, I'm getting it now. So Paul's teaching. Which, by the way, that's what that, all that 13 years was with this incredible education. Um, and so, uh, but if you chose the one he didn't prefer, you said, well, why? Why did, why, did, why did you choose that one? You know, of course, they were both great. It was he did them, right? But uh, I tried, I, I learned to, to try to, to turn that around if I could on him because he, you know, he taught graphic design in the graduate school at Yale. So he was a for many years, he was a teacher. And uh, I tried to turn it around and ask him why he didn't like it. And then he would get in the teaching mode. And it was, I mean, that, that was just incredible stuff. And I, I, miss, I miss all that. He was a wonderful man.